It's my pleasure to welcome Julian Zelazar, who is one of our faculty members. It always means more when one of our own does one of these talks. Um, he's the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs, because we believe in short titles here at the school. Um, Julian is a prolific writer, and he's a frequent media commentary. And what he does is he translates current events through a historical lens for a broad audience. From President Obama's speech at the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, to Ted Cruz's chances for the presidency, to Hillary Clinton's email scandal, uh, Julian has an opinion and insight into all things policy. Um, when he's not teaching or giving up-to-the-minute insight, Julian has authored several books, and the most recent of which is what he'll discuss tonight, The, First, the Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the Battle for the Great Society. Uh, Johnson is increasingly referenced for his ability to commandeer Congress. Um, but as the book, The Fierce Urgency of Now, shows, the political climate in the time was more controversial than is often remembered. And the collective achievements that came to be called the Great Society were not the norm, nor were they possible without compromise and allies. As Julian writes, Johnson once complained, quote, the only power I've got is nuclear, and I can't use that. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Uh, at the Wilson School, one of our primary objectives, objectives is to learn and develop strategies for effective public policy. But as Julian writes, quote, only if we understand how political landscapes change and can be changed will we ever have a chance to break the gridlock in Washington. Um, so we really welcome the discussion today. It is the anniversary of the Great uh, Society, so the timing is perfect. Um, we will have time for questions after his talk, and we'll have a book sale in the lobby. So thank you, and Julian. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to speak here on my home base. Uh, and I want to start with a story that took place just hours after John F. Kennedy's assassination in November of 1963. At 4 a.m., the morning after the assassination in Dallas, President Lyndon Johnson had returned to Washington, and he was reclining in his bed after a very long and frightening day. And he calls for an impromptu meeting of his advisors. And this was something he often liked to do, have bedside meetings. And Lady Bird would often try to sleep through these. Uh, she was accustomed to them, although she was not at this one. And the new president laid in his bed, and Jack Valenti, Bill Moyers, and Cliff Carter all surrounded him. And Johnson, still trying to get over what had happened in Dallas, at the same time had grand ambitions about what he wanted to do. And he lays out his agenda to his advisors. According to Jack Valenti, he said the following, I'm going to get Kennedy's tax cut out of the Senate Finance Committee, and we're going to get the economy humming again. Then I'm going to pass Kennedy's civil rights bill, which has been hung up in Congress way too long and I'm going to pass it without changing a single comma or word. After that, we'll pass legislation that allows everyone anywhere in this country to vote with all the barriers down. And that's not all, he said, looking up at the three men. We're going to get a law that says every boy and girl in this country, no matter how poor, no matter what the color of their skin or the region they come from, is going to be able to get all the education they want by loan, scholarship, or grant right from the federal government. And after pausing to catch his breath, almost exhausted by his own ambitions, he said, and I'm going to pass Harry Truman's medical insurance bill that got nowhere before. Jack Valenti's recollection of that meeting might not be exactly accurate, but it perfectly portrays Lyndon Johnson the former member of Congress, the former Senate Majority Leader and Vice President, who now found himself as the President of the United States. Johnson was a creature of Congress, a legislator with long experience and deep ties to members of Capitol Hill. And what he wanted to do as President was to have Congress enact nothing less than a second New Deal. And what's remarkable about the years between 1963 and really 1966, only a couple years into his presidency, was just how much passed 
during that short time. Medicare and Medicaid, civil rights and voting rights, a war on poverty with food stamps and Head Start, uh, federal education assistance to elementary and secondary schools and higher education, environmental reform, funding for the arts and culture, and even smaller measures that we don't think of as part of the great society, like legislation requiring safety caps on medicine so that children can't get into the bottle. And what's remarkable is not just how much passed in a short time period, but how much remains on the books and how much remains part of American public policy today. After several decades of the age of Reagan, as historians call it, with a conservative revolution that changed politics since the 1960s, much of the great society remains intact. And many of you will remember the story that when President Obama proposed his Affordable Care Act, which included Medicare savings, um, Tea Party Republicans carried banners that said, get your government hands off my Medicare. <laughs> and the statement was funny, it was hypocritical, but it also reflected a lot of what this period accomplished. These policies became so inscribed in American politics, even conservatives could sometimes be found defending them. Many of the explanations of why this happened why did so much change and why did we get so much legislation? Why was Washington not broken for a short time span? Revolve around two arguments. The first is the idea that this was a liberal era in American politics. Americans believed in government, liberalism was strong, and getting legislation through Congress was not that hard. This was the last gasp of liberalism that really started to flourish with the New Deal. And the second argument revolves around LBJ himself. After years when Johnson was remembered as one of the most ineffective and disastrous presidents in American history because of Vietnam, in recent years we've had a revival of Lyndon Johnson where he's often treated as a legislative wizard, a political mastermind who knew how to do what nobody else could do. He knew how to twist arms. He knew how to seduce his opponents and cajole them at the same time and get them to give him the vote that he wanted. And the most iconic image of Lyndon Johnson, which some of you uh, probably have seen, is called the treatment. Uh, this is something he liked to do both as a senator and as president when he would physically invade the space of colleagues, whether they were supporters or opponents, hover over them at six foot four and 230 pounds and berate them, lobby them, and persuade them into doing what he wanted to do. I have some pictures in the books of the treatment which I think reflects part of our explanation of what made that period different. The book, which is a narrative history of the great society from the start to the finish, from 1963 to 68, argues that both of those explanations are really not sufficient. First, in terms of this being a liberal era, that doesn't really explain what Congress was like in the early 1960s. During this period, Congress was a bastion of conservative power. Back then, there was a coalition of Southern Democrats who controlled most of the key committees and Midwestern Republicans who teamed up until 1964 to kill everything that was liberal. They used the power of the committee chairmanship to stifle programs like civil rights, like voting rights, like health care for the aged, and like education policy. There were people like James Eastland, a Mississippi senator who liked to joke that he had extra pockets made in his pants just to bury all the civil rights bills that he never allowed to come up for a vote. There was Howard Smith, the tall and lanky Virginia congressman who chaired the House Rules Committee, a very powerful committee who once in the 1950s had pretended there was a fire back on his barn back in Virginia just so he could leave and not allow a civil rights vote to come up and take place. Sam Rayburn said he knew Howard Smith would resort to just about anything to stop civil rights, but he didn't think that would include arson. The second argument also, I think, 
is more myth than reality. We have overstated the power of the presidency. We have exaggerated what Lyndon Johnson and presidents in general could do on their own. The quote that Elizabeth mentioned, power, the only power I've got is nuclear and I can't even use that, perfectly captures how Lyndon Johnson thought of the presidency. One of the things Johnson understood very clearly was that presidential power was limited. He always used to tell his advisors that Congress got the best of every president and that eventually it was going to get the best of him. And he was very determined upon taking office to get as much through Congress as quickly as possible because he knew once Congress turned against him, there wasn't much that he was going to be able to do. The last part of my book, which I'll talk about, looks at the years between 1966 and 68 when conservatives were back in power on Capitol Hill and Johnson, with all his tricks, with all the treatment, couldn't get a lot of legislation through anymore. So the book starts in the early 1960s during the period in 1963 and 1964 when most people argued that Congress was dysfunctional. If you look at newspapers, if you look at political scientists, if you look at popular writers about American politics, one of the main themes when Johnson took over was that Congress was broken, that this bipartisan coalition wouldn't pass a thing. Liberal Senator Joseph Clark of Pennsylvania wrote a book and he said that his colleagues constituted the sapless branch of government. One month after Kennedy's death, Life magazine publishes a memorial issue about the president, and the lead article is LBJ versus the lethargic Congress. And the editors wonder, can even LBJ with his skills do anything on a Capitol Hill that seems so determined to stifle all kinds of progress? The book moves through the heyday of the Great Society, 1964 to 66, when all this transformative legislation passed, and ends in the final years of his presidency when conservatives regain strength in Congress and the momentum of liberalism comes to a halt. So I wanted to just quickly walk you through the book with a few stories from each of these sections to give you a flavor of what I'm trying to say. So the first part of the book really wants to understand how did the logjam in Congress come to an end? How did this period which one political scientist, James McGregor Burns, say was a period where there was a deadlock of democracy. How did it end? And in the first part of the book, the main actor is not Lyndon Johnson. The main actor really is the civil rights movement. And I argue the first big legislation, the first transformative bill is the Civil Rights Act of 64, which ends desegregation in public accommodations in the South. And the narrative really brings together the different ways in which the civil rights movement changed public opinion on Capitol Hill and organized liberals so that they could counteract the strategy and the fight of the Southerners to stop this legislation. Part of the movement uh, is, constitutes the stories you're familiar with. It involved Martin Luther King and local activists who went into cities like uh, uh, Birmingham, and raised public attention for the issue of racial justice. Civil rights activists in 1964 often threatened members of Congress that if they did not vote for this legislation, they would bring attention to their states. So Senator Everett Dirksen, the Senate Republican minority leader, often called the Wizard of Ooze because of his long-winded speeches, um, uh, was constantly hearing from civil rights activists that they were going to go into his hometown, they were going to go into cities like Chicago, which they actually did, and bring media attention to the fact this senator was not supporting the bill. Civil rights activists were also important inside the Beltway, something we often forget. They mobilized in Washington to counteract Southern power. So in April and May of 1964, the Southerners are filibustering the Civil Rights Bill. And liberals conduct, the civil rights activists conduct a really impressive mobilization to finally and once and for all stop and stifle all the tricks that Southerners like to play. 
And some of this involved vote counts, and some of this involved the rules of the Senate and figuring out what the Southerners were going to do. But I have one story which kind of reflects what they did at the most basic level. On April 13th, 1964, the filibuster has started against the Civil Rights Bill, and it's opening day of the Washington Senators' baseball game. So Johnson is at the game to throw out the first pitch, and he then goes into the stands and is surrounded by most of the leading members of Congress, uh, both the Senate and House leadership in both parties, for the first couple innings, they're watching the game, drinking beer, eating popcorn. You can see pictures of this. And then all of a sudden, between the third and fourth inning, the announcer goes on. But instead of announcing something going on in the game, he says, all US senators are requested to return to the chamber immediately. <laughs> the legislators, the senators understood what that meant. The Southerners had called for a quorum call. And when they called for a quorum call, there had to be 51 people there in the Senate or the day ended. And for Southerners who were fewer in number, the day ending meant they could replenish their voices. They would all get to give another series of speeches. It was actually quite important to sustaining the filibuster. So liberals had to get back immediately before the quorum call finished. Humphrey gets up from his seat, he's furious, he's visibly waving his hands, frustrated, because he knows what the Southerners had done. He thought there was an informal agreement not to have a quorum call during opening day. And quickly, they all leave the stadium, except for Richard Russell, the, Senate, uh, the senator from Georgia, who was the leader of the filibuster forces, who sits there with a smirk on his face, very pleased with what he had done. But when Humphrey and the other Northerners leave the stadium, there's a line of limousines there that had been sent by the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, an umbrella group of civil rights organizations, which was there to take the senators back to the Senate chamber, to be there within nine minutes for the quorum call, and to defeat the Southern trick. This is a small story. It's a colorful story, but it captures the kind of organizational battle that civil rights activists conducted to break this filibuster. And one other small story, uh, there were parts of the civil rights movement we forget. Religious leaders were quite important uh, in, in the battle for civil rights. And one of the struggles was how do you win the support of Republicans from states like Illinois and Wisconsin, where the African American vote was not large enough to really create the kind of pressure that was needed for them to vote against the Southerners on the filibuster. So civil rights activists tapped into liberal religious leaders and moderate religious leaders who actively lobbied in the spring of 1964, telling these Republicans that you have to allow the bill to come up for a vote. The secret of passing this civil rights bill, Hubert Humphrey said, are the religious groups. Just wait till my colleagues start to hear from them. And they did. Religious leaders came to Washington. They personally lobbied members of Congress. National religious organizations coordinated with local preachers in states like Illinois, where they would deliver a sermon that had a message about the need to let this up for a vote. And the leaders, the religious leaders, would urge their congregants to write their senators uh, to bring this to an end. There's one story where South Dakota Republican Carl Munt, one of the most conservative members of Congress who had absolutely no interest in civil rights, receives calls from a bishop and a priest, one of whom he had gone to high school with, who implore him to vote for cloture, to vote to allow the civil rights bill to come up, and that is what turned him uh, in that direction. The next part of the book goes between the years 1964 and 1966, which is really the heart of the Great Society. This is the Medicare, Medicaid education programs, voting rights, and much, much more. And one of the key things that takes place uh, during this period, which is so basic, it's so fundamental, yet we forget about it when we're talking about why Lyndon Johnson was so successful, that was the election of 1964. 
The election of 1964 is a landslide victory for liberal Democrats. Democrats leave that election with 295 seats in the House and 68 seats in the Senate. The balance between liberals and conservatives within the Democratic Party shifts decisively to the liberals. And in addition to liberals having control of both chambers, Republicans are terrified after the election of 64 of looking too conservative. Barry Goldwater, the senator from Arizona, had run on the Republican ticket, and he ran as a right-wing conservative. He ran as a conservative who said uh, that extremism is actually a virtue when it's in pursuit. This is not the actual quote. In the pursuit of liberty is a virtue. And Johnson and the Democrats devastated him. They ran ads portraying him as far right, which he actually was. There was one ad that showed two hands ripping up a social security card. There was another ad where you see a map of Arizona and a map of Washington, little dots going back and forth. And the narrator says, these are all the trips that Barry Goldwater took back to Washington to vote against Medicare. There were ads associating the Goldwater Miller ticket, that was his running mate, William Miller, with far right organizations like the KKK. One KKK leader said he supported their ticket, and Democrats were careful to put that in one of the ads. <laughs> and then there was, of course, the famous Daisy ad, uh, where you see a little girl picking petals off a flower, counting each petal until you then hear a government voice counting down and a mushroom cloud erupts, which you see in her eyeball, and the viewer says, these are the stakes in this election. So after the election, after the election, Republicans were willing to work on domestic policy. Many Republicans were either going to vote for administration bills, or they were going to propose some alternative of their own, but they did not want to be the party of obstruction. And same with most Southern Democrats, who were also equally frightful, fearful, of the label of being an extremist. So one person you see this change, it's a great story, Wilbur Mills. So Wilbur Mills, many of you will remember for a different story. Um, some will remember this is a, a power broker in Washington, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. His career will end in a big sex scandal involving a stripper. But in the mid-60s, Wilbur Mills was one of the most forceful, powerful voices in Washington. In 1961, 1962, 1963, and even in 1964, after Kennedy had died, every time that a proposal emerged for Medicare, for hospital insurance for the elderly, Wilbur Mills would not even let it up for a vote in the House Ways and Means Committee. Mills and others in this conservative coalition argued that this was too costly, that it would result in increased social security taxes, which was going to pay for hospital insurance. And they often echoed the arguments of the American Medical Association that this would result in socialized medicine. And until 1964, those arguments were made around the country. The AMA was fierce in fighting Medicare in ways that make the fight against the Affordable Care Act look tame. They did argue that it was socialized medicine. Ronald Reagan made a record uh, in which he explained to people this was the opening wedge. Once you provide health care for the aged, the government will take over everything else. And the wives of AMA members used to have coffee clutches where they'd play Reagan's uh, record and talk about the dangers of Medicare. The AMA sent pamphlets and posters to the offices of physicians so that a patient would leave their appointment and they'd be given a pamphlet warning that if Medicare passes, the next time you come here, uh, you're going to be meeting with a government bureaucrat. So when Wilbur Mills said no, he had a lot of force behind him in addition to the power of being chairman of Ways and Means. And even in the spring of 64, after Kennedy had died, after all the goodwill we talk about, following Kennedy's death to, fill, to finish and fulfill his agenda, Wilbur Mills said no once again. None of that changed him. Johnson leaned on him. He pressured him. He threatened him. Some Democrats said, we're going to go around you. We're going to do it through the Senate. But Mills killed the bill. After the election, 
in late November of 64, Mills could read the writing on the wall. He understood that given the new liberal majorities and given the fact most Republicans were going to vote for something, if he said no, liberals were going to do this and circumvent him and that it would probably work. He would be humiliated as a chairman. So Mills changes his tune. In December, he announces back in Arkansas, yeah, I'll support something like the administration's plan. In January, he more proactively calls for hearings. By February, not only is Mills saying he supports the administration's Medicare proposal, Republicans offer two different alternatives of their own. And then in April of 1965, Wilbur Mills surprises everyone, including the White House, and says, let's take all these different proposals and make one giant bill. So the opponent of Medicare in 1964, after the election, turns into the architect of something much grander than even Lyndon Johnson had imagined. And the result is Medicare A, which pays for hospital insurance, Medicare B, which was the Republican proposal, pays for physician's insurance, and Medicaid, which also came out of a conservative alternative to Medicare. The final part of the book looks at the period when the window for liberalism closes. And the years between 66 and 68, as I said at the beginning, are the years where all the arguments we have about Lyndon Johnson don't make as much sense. Where all the kind of value and belief we now have in what he could do, what the schmoozer could do, what the arm twister could do, run into the reality of a Capitol Hill that turns against this president. So this section, one of the stories <coughs> that I talk about, is Johnson's third major civil rights proposal. And that's for open housing. So Johnson sends a bill in April of 1966 to Congress which would end racial discrimination in the sale or rental of housing. And when he sends, this is something that Martin Luther King was also bringing national attention to. King moves into an apartment in the slums of Chicago, and housing becomes seen as the next critical issue. When Johnson sends this to Congress, all hell breaks loose. Many uh, who oppose this are not the Southerners who don't care about this as much as many Northerners. And it's not just Northern conservatives who have problems with the bill, but it's many Democratic constituencies in cities like Chicago who, when they hear the government is going to regulate how people can sell or rent their property, come out against the administration. So after he sends this bill through the summer and early fall of 1966, the legislation is going terribly. A lot of people tell the administration there's no way we're going to vote for this. And there's also a very clear backlash against the administration and against civil rights. In Illinois, one of the icons of American liberalism, Senator Paul Douglas, who had been one of the liberal lions who had been pushing for these kinds of measures since the 1940s and 1950s, finds himself being criticized and under attack from voters in traditional New Deal liberal constituencies in places like Chicago. And Douglas is facing off against a guy named Charles Percy, who was a very good-looking businessman who one reporter said looked like Hollywood had cast him for the role of senator. And Percy, who was a moderate on civil rights, actually capitalizes on this backlash that's brewing. In October 1966, Lyndon Johnson calls Paul Douglas and he says, do you want me to come to Chicago? Do you want me to come to Illinois and campaign for you? And in the, the, the tape is really amazing. Douglas says, there's a really big, he says, a white backlash taking place, and I don't think it would benefit either of us to have you in the state. In the midterm elections of 1966, that conservative coalition of Southern Democrats and Republicans regains its strength. The open housing bill is stifled in Congress. Republicans gain 47 seats during the midterm elections, and the balance within the Democratic Party goes back in favor of the conservatives. In 1967, the agenda turns to new issues. While Johnson still is trying to get this civil rights bill through Congress, the conservatives want to talk about other things. 
And the big thing they want to talk about is guns versus butter. A lot of 1967 and 1968 revolve around really fierce budget wars, where the conservatives in Congress tell the president, Mr. President, if you want to continue financing the war in Vietnam, which he did, you are going to have to cut domestic spending. You are going to have to stop growing the government, and you are going to have to trim the programs that you've already passed. And this consumes the final uh, year, 1967 and 1968, of his presidency. And Johnson's still pushing for things like open housing, but the, the politics has turned. And Congress, as he always predicted, has turned against him. At one point in these debates, one of his advisors calls the president and says, Pres Mr. President, why are you so fearful? Can't you get the Congress to move on some of these items? After all, he says, you're the master of the Senate. That's what everyone says. Johnson, who's furious, you can hear the anger in the phone call, says, master of the Senate. I'm not the master of a damn thing. We can't make this Congress do one damn thing that I know of. No spending on anything. Congress will finally pass an open housing bill in 1968, two years after the measure is proposed. They pass it, incidentally, a few days after Martin Luther King's assassination. What really moves Congress in the end is not Johnson's calls for the bill, but a fear, a sense of desperation that rioting and chaos is going to break out in the streets, which it started to do if something was not done in response to the assassination. The final open housing bill is also a really limited version of what was originally proposed. There's no enforcement mechanism to speak of. It only covers a limited amount of the housing stock in the United States, and it's not the same kind of ambitious legislation. It's much more symbolic than the Civil Rights Act in 64 or the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So this is the story of the fierce urgency of now. The book is not meant to diminish Lyndon Johnson as a figure. I, in fact, argue he's a very skillful politician who understood Congress well. But, as he said, Congress always does get the best of every president. So the book really tries to understand why did Congress change for those few years, and how did LBJ capitalize on the opportunity that activists and voters had created for Washington. While this is a narrative history filled with great figures like Everett Dirksen and Andrew B. Miller, one of the lobbyists for the AFL-CIO, and Martin Luther King and Johnson himself, I do hope that it's instructive today as we deal with the Washington which looks bleak and broken. Thank you very much.